Good morning. Um, we're going to try and keep a tight schedule because we have this fantastic lineup of speakers and we want to hear from all of them. Um, so this meeting represents the sixth annual Isabel Rappin Communication Disorders Conference. And uh, Lisa Schulman and I worked together to put it together a program that we thought would have appeal for clinicians, researchers, and families alike. And uh, so to this end, you'll see that in our lineup of speakers who are here to discuss current issues and recent adva advances in research on autism, we have perspectives ranging from the developmental pediatrician all the way to um, people doing basic research in animal models. So we're really running the span from clinical to very basic research. Uh, but we believe that we have the greatest potential for success in advancing uh, our understanding of autism and treatment of autism when we all work together to define and address questions that are of so much interest to all of us. The talks uh, representing highly relevant and diverse approaches to advancing understanding of autism address the pressing questions of how do you identify autism at the earliest possible time point to allow for early in intervention, which we know is so important? Can we subgroup autism to, into different groups to optimize treatment and get closer to personalized and informed treatment? What are the underlying brain processing differences and neuropathologies that may lead to the characteristic features of autism? And finally, how can we best treat core and associated symptoms of autism? An area of particular interest in autism for myself as well as for Lisa is minimally verbal individuals on whom there's relatively little research at this point, and, but for whom outcomes are porous, so for whom it's most needed. So to this end, we're fortunate to have the highly accomplished Helen Tagger Flussberg from Boston University as our plenary speaker. And um, from her, we'll hear about new approaches to understanding language in minimally verbal autism spectrum disorder. And I'd like to go through all of the talks because I'm so excited about all of them, but we don't have the time and they'll speak for themselves. Um, this conference was started in honor of Isabel Rappin, who attended the first four of our meetings. Um, and most of you know about Isabel and her accomplishments and how critical she was to um, really bridging the clinical research divide and advancing our understanding of autism and language processing in this group. Um, sadly, she passed away in May of 2017, and this is the first meeting we've had since her passing. Uh, and we feel that this meeting in particular really honors her work with its focus on autism and consideration of the clinical and research domains. Ted Kastner, the director of our Children's Evaluation and Rehabilitation Center, also known as CIRS, um, and I'm the chair of developmental pediatrics, worked with as Isabel, I think it was during his residency, is that? Yeah. Um, training here at Einstein, and um, he will present us now with a short remembrance. All right. Okay. So first, I'd like to congratulate Sophie and uh, and Steve, both the co-director and director of the IDDRC, on this conference. It's an outstanding meeting, um, and I think as Folks from Einstein, we can take pride in the fact that much of the work being done at the IDDRC and the work by the speakers today uh, comes from Einstein and is with people who've been affiliated with Einstein. I'm also pleased that by 5 o'clock today, we will have submitted our proposal to the Simons Foundation to become a member of the Spark Network, a network of uh, research centers that are recruiting 600 subjects per year uh, to collect genetic specimens and support genetics based. Uh, autism research. I think that that kind of a project is an example of how departments of pediatrics, neurosciences, psychiatry, and neurology 
can collectively uh, leverage our separate resources and combine them to become greater than what we can each do separately. I would like to especially thank Dr. Gordon Tomaselli, our prodigal dean, for being a champion in, in this effort, and he's been very supportive of, I think, the work we've been doing individually and moving forward the work that we'll be doing collectively. So I think today is an auspicious day for the kind of collaboration that we want to build and continue to support. So you all understand Dr. Rappin was a force of nature in neurology. Um, she died just over a year ago. And there are many wonderful tributes that have been written by people who had a deep personal relationship with her. The best of these include an active publication by Nico Moshe and Mark Mailer in 2017. Um, Nico is the director of the Child Neurology Program, um, who I met in the early 80s when he was a young faculty person. I'd love to hear what he has to say about you know, a career-long relationship with Dr. Rappin. My own experience is much more limited. I was just one of thousands of the trainees that you know, bumped into her or she, or she mentored over the 60 years that she was at Einstein. Um, and I hope just the fact that it's a brief encounter doesn't diminish the, the, you know, my ability to tell a good story. So let me take you back a little bit, all the way back to 1981. Um, the gas shocks, there were gasoline shocks, there were recessions in 73 and 79. The, the country was, as Carter described it, in a malaise. And um, there was a new president. And uh, there was an, a sense of optimism and some muted hope for the future. Um, the Bronx at the time was deservedly notorious. Th it was the place where the politicians came to have a photo op and then disappear. So they would come and they would launch a new program about urban renewal, municipal bankruptcy, the war on drugs, whatever. For many of those politicians, they made the visit once. They never came back. But the Bronx was and still is a remarkable place for the training and practice of medicine and clinical research. In 1981, Jacoby Medical Center and the Albert Einstein College of Medicine were partners. This is before the pediatric residencies at Einstein Jacoby and North Central Bronx Montefiore combined. So the primary teaching affiliate of Einstein was Jacoby. It was a great partnership because Jacoby had a rich clinical population, an amazing clinical service. And Weiler Hospital at Einstein had a different mix of patients, but the patients there were tied to the research enterprise in a way that they weren't at Jacoby. So it was a great experience to move back and forth between the two. At the time, Dr. Rappin was a mid-career faculty person, um, already recognized as an international leader in child neurology and developmental disorders. She had helped found both the Child Neurology Service and the IDDRC. She was working with Doris Allen, who I remember, as, uh, on an NIH-funded communication disorders center. Um, and it was through that early work in the broader area of communication and language development that she became interested in autism. And because of her foresight, preparation, and some good luck, as she said, uh, she was ready when the autism epidemic developed over the next few decades. So I, I couldn't find a picture Dr. Rappin from the 80s, the, the Dr. Rappin that I met. But this is a picture that's all over the internet, and uh, I don't want you to get the wrong impression. In 1981, Dr. Rappin wasn't the kindly grandmother that you see in this picture. <laughs> she was 53, a seasoned mid-career scientist, clinician, who had been at Einstein for 23 years and accomplished more than most of us could ever expect to accomplish in our lifetimes. During rounds, she was in in inquisitive, compassionate, and generous in her dealings with her patients. She was an excellent teacher with an encyclopedic knowledge of child neurology and developmental disorders. She was confident, precise. She's Swiss, after all. Worked hard and expected no less from the people that she worked with. When I've read the descriptions about her, the word that stands out to me most is formidable. And by that I mean, if you didn't meet those standards, she could cut you down with a glance. Um, there were a lot of people who had a very successful relationship with her, but in 1981, I really personally had very different priorities. I finished my fourth year of medical school early, six months early. I got married. I moved to Burlington, Vermont, 
and I was a cabinet maker for six months. Um, despite graduating from medical school, I had really deep ambivalence about being a physician. Um, after I was accepted to Jacoby Einstein, my wife and I bought a house in Hoboken, New Jersey in 1981. I spent the next seven years renovating the house. In short, Dr. Rappin and I were very, very far apart. She was plumbing the depths of the human brain and, and, and the human experience, and I was literally doing the plumbing. Um, <laughs> it was a long, a long way to go. Um, I, did, I did find a picture of me from that period of time. I think this is a picture of me in the Lubin cafeteria uh, while we were covering patients at uh, Einstein. Um, so here I am. I'm struggling in my new role as a resident. And it's during the time that I have my really only interaction with Dr. Rappin. We were on the inpatient unit at, at Weiler, and one of her patients had some kind of urgent need. And I don't remember what it was, but it was the middle of the night. And there was probably a conversation between myself and the resident, who could have been you know, Bob Marion or Harris Goldberg, you know, people who were, uh, Harris Goldstein, I'm sorry, people who are in the Einstein community still. And the conversation probably went something like this. You call her. No, you call her. So, no, you're the intern. You call her. So it's 2 in the morning. I'm terrified. I have no idea how I'm going to deal with this. Um, aside from my prodigious appetite, I was actually a pretty quick study. So back then, there's no internet. There's no smartphones. Uh, there were like some books at the nurse's station and maybe a couple of journals. So I spent the next hour working on the finest case presentation ever made. My summary was confident and precise. My understanding of the pathophysiology was encyclopedic. My differential diagnosis was exhaustive and presented in rank order from most likely to least likely. And I called her at 3 in the morning. With a high level of high, you know, caffeine-induced adrenaline, I launched into my tour de force. And it was midway through my epic when she interrupted me and said, with the wisdom of a clinician who has deep clinical experience, I think this can wait till morning. <laughs> and that was it. It was over. Um, I didn't know what to do, and I can't remember how I spent the rest of the night, but after all the caffeine I had drunk, I don't think I, I spent much time you know, sleeping. Um, over the next five years, as I trained as a resident in pediatrics and a fellow in developmental behavioral pediatrics, my perspective on medicine changed. I came to appreciate the unique opportunity that uh, was offered to me as a trainee and later as a practicing physician. It might have been Dr. Rappin, but, but I think really it was the bigger culture of Jacoby and Einstein at the time um, that, that helped me. In either way, I came to understand what Dr. Rappin has said and what Nico Moshe has reported in his tender memorial, which is that every patient can teach us something. That, that precept, as Nico has said, is in, in, imprinted in the Department of Neurology's philosophy of teaching clinical activities and research. And I think it's really imprinted in Einstein and Montefiore and the culture that these two organizations currently have. Um, so I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to share my remembrance and reflect upon my formative experiences and wish you all a successful day today. Thank you.